When we derived the short-run cost of production, where we could only vary labor because capital was fixed, it was pretty easy to do. For any level of output, we just had to figure out how much labor do we need to hire, then we multiplied that amount by the wage to give us the short-run cost. The reason it was pretty easy was because for any level of output, there really was only one way to produce that level of output, and that is to hire enough labor. But when we now have two inputs that we can vary, both labor and capital, we don't just have one way of producing any given level of output. We can use many different bundles of inputs, bundles of labor and capital, to produce the same level of output. And so when we ask how much it is it going to cost to produce a certain level of output, we first have to figure out what input bundle are we actually going to use to do it. So how do we represent the input bundles that produce the same level of output in this graph? Well, we would go to our production function. We would go to the height on the vertical axis that represents the level of production that we're interested in. And then we take a horizontal slice of this function. That horizontal slice would look something like this. And when we take that and put it into the space of input bundles, we just project it down into the lower plane in this three-dimensional graph, we get something that looks like this. And that, of course, looks familiar because it looks exactly like an indifference curve for consumers. And in fact, it was derived in exactly the same way. When we derived indifference curves, we had utility on this vertical axis. And we said, let's go to a certain level of utility. Let's take the horizontal slice of the utility function. That'll give us all the combinations of the good one and good two that result in the same level of utility. In other words, an indifference curve. Now we have what we call isoquants. And instead of utility being the label on these isoquants, output will be the label. So this will tell us all the combination of capital and labor that can produce a certain level of the output. Now it looks exactly like an indifference curve, and in many ways it is very much like an indifference curve. But in one way it's not like an indifference curve. Firms are not indifferent between the production plans on an isoquant. Firms are indifferent between production plans that result in the same level of profit. So the indifference curves for firms are really the profit lines or the profit plane that uh, we've been talking about before. But in other ways, this curve can be interpreted in many ways that are analogous to what we did for indifference curves. For example, we can pick a point, an input bundle, and draw the slope and ask, what does that slope mean? Well, for the consumers, that was the marginal rate of substitution, the rate at which the consumer was willing to substitute good two for one more of good one. Well, now it's going to be the rate at which the producer can substitute capital for labor in production without changing the level of output. So the slope here tells us how much capital can we let go of when we hire one more worker and produce exactly the same as we did before. Now we're going to call this the technical rate of substitution. Or sometimes we call it the marginal technical rate of substitution and we'll abbreviate it by TRS. So instead of marginal rate of substitution, it's the technical rate of substitution to differentiate it from the slope of an indifference curve for consumers. And you can see that if we have a lot of capital and very little labor, then we can easily let go of capital. If we hire one more worker, we can let go of a lot of capital and still end up producing the same as we did before. But if we have very little capital and a lot of labor, that slope is shallow, which means that if we hire one more worker, we can't let go of very much capital and still produce the same level of output. So that's the first feature that's similar to indifference curves. 
Second, we can talk about the shapes of these isoquants. Remember that for consumers, when those indifference curves looked more like straight lines, we said there was a high degree of substitutability. Exactly the same thing is going to be true here. When we have relatively flat indifference, I mean isoquants, then it means that capital and labor are relatively substitutable in production. If, on the other hand, the isoquants are more like L shapes, more like the shapes of perfect complements, then we would say that capital and labor are relatively complementary in production. So you could think of uh, a production process where you have robots and workers doing the same thing on an assembly line. In that case, they would be relatively substitutable and we would have isoquants that are relatively flat. Or you could think of another kind of firm where workers work on computers to design house plans, for example. In that case, the computers and the workers have to work together. They're very complementary in production, and we would get shapes of isoquants that are more like the L shapes. So the shapes of the isoquants have a very similar interpretation to shapes of indifference curves. Finally, we can talk about how isoquants are related to one another within an isoquant map. Remember, there isn't just one isoquant, just like there wasn't just one indifference curve for consumers. This is just the isoquant that tells us the combination of inputs that produces this level of output. But we could take slices at other levels of outputs and that would give us different isoquants. So we have a whole map of isoquants. And in this class, we're going to assume that our isoquant maps are always going to be homothetic. Well, homothetic means exactly what it meant for consumers. It means that if we have an isoquant, and we know what the technical rate of substitution is at some point on that isoquant, we will know that the technical rate of substitution will be the same on all the other isoquants along a ray from the origin that goes through that point. And that will be true for every ray through the origin. In fact, most of the utility functions that we use to represent production processes in economics are homothetic. So we're not making a very stringent assumption. And remember that homothetic production functions, just like homothetic utility functions, can give rise to um, isoquants that are more like perfect substitutes or more like perfect complements or anything in between. So we'll make that assumption that our isoquant maps are homothetic throughout the rest of the course.